out a podcast where two bearded film fans watch the best and worst horror movies of all time. My name is Luke Condor, and joined by my regular co-host, Mr. Andy Conduit Turner. Hello, everybody. And we have no Ben Errington today. He's on holiday. He's uh, gone to Torquay. He's gone for a walkie around Torquay, a walkie-talkie. Um, and we're, we're, we've not gone with him this time. The show, the show must just go on, right? So we've got we to gotta do it. Yeah. He told us he's going to, is it Paint and Zoo he's at today? Seeing if any baboons bark at any boys, you will know what to do. <laughs> Paint and Zoo. Um, what are, you, are you a zoo fan? Do you go to zoos often? <laughs> often is, it, is, that a thing? is that a hobby of yours? Yeah, I'm not, a, a week. Not, I'm not a daily zoo <laughs> visitor, but I don't, I don't mind a zoo. Um, I went to yeah. Bristol Zoo just before we moved out of there for my birthday. It was nice to see the animals and we kind of get wrapped around the moral quandary of zoos because it's a zoo that only like has you know only does things for like breeding because otherwise they would be going extinct it isn't like a yeah oh, these these animals are nice have a look at them and and things like that so they try to be like less exploitative i guess but basically i do like looking at the animals they're all really nice what's your favorite part of the of the zoo um I like the reptile house because they're interesting. I like to see the crocodiles and stuff. They're cool. I always enjoy a little look at the sea lions. They're, they're having fun. Oh, when they're skidding around. And the yeah, as well, sliding, sliding about. Around, so, yeah, yeah. Lo- love them otters and the other sort of aquatic mammals. Yeah. Like a zoo with a bat house, Luke. I like going into little bat caves, seeing them all flying yeah. about the place. Um, you haven't mentioned yeah. the monkey, monkey house yet, and they're the best. No. I'm... I'm I'm a monkey man myself. You, you love you love them apes. <laughs> I, I just think there's just so interesting to look at them. They're so agile the way they sort of swing around and chase each other, and they look they look they look superhuman. It's like watching yeah. superheroes, like lots of little yeah. Spider Men jumping true. around, or s- swinging about the place. Sometimes Shooting like the stuff out of the uh, some, yeah, <laughs> out of their orifices. <laughs> but um, yeah. Yeah, sometimes with some of the apes, it totally depends on the enclosure. Maybe that's why I didn't pick it, because I think a good ape enclosure, it's like, oh, you know, you've got loads of space and everything like that. But if you ever see one where they look bored or sad, it's like, yeah. oh, you're clever enough to understand what being bored is. You're not like a, you know, an animal that doesn't have that conscious decision. I seem to but... remember there was one where it was like on a mound and there were big monkeys, big gorilla type ones. I don't know, I was very young. And they had like little uh, like bin lids that they were using to skid down the to slide down the hill. They go back up the hill and do sledging. Sledging, oh. yeah, it's cute. Sounds great. Yeah, I do. Now, now we've spoken about it, Luke. I, I'm up in my rating of a zoo, A plus. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So horror news, Ben. Where is the? There is no Ben. There is no horror news. Well, that's what you would say. Uh, but we, we not googled to... it. <laughs> <laughs> we not googled it. Um, I so it's Takashi Miike's birthday uh, today. That that's worthy of news, right? Yeah, Takashi happy Mike, birthday. The kind of master of what is it called? V Cinema. That's what they called it, right? It was like cheap Asian cinema that was kind of extreme that students and whatever all around the world would V Cinema. I think it was called V Cinema. Uh, there was a, I know there was a DVD imprint which I had like the audition on and things like that. That was called, it was like Tartan Asia Extreme, was the was the uh, label. Yeah, I had a few of those. Don't know what Tartan is to do with Asia in particular. Scottish Extreme, is that? Yeah, you should see the Scottish ex- Extreme cinema films. Jesus. Yeah. It, um, just you know really. <laughs> Like accents that you really have to tune in on. We should do a Scottish movie. I'm sure there are some good Scottish horror movies. Yeah. Um, Takashi Miike, do you have a favourite Miike film? Throw me some out, Luke, and I'll try and see if, I, if I've got any favourites. Have we got the list there as we're celebrating the birthday? I have, actually, yeah. Uh, so, Itchy the Killer is a big yeah. one that a lot of people are going about. 13 Assassins. Uh, the Happiness of the Katakuris. Visit the queue, uh, rainy dog, the bird people in China, audition. What was that one? Um, oh, Goza, Goza. That's a, an an oh, insane one. I don't think I've seen Goza. I think of the ones you've you've gone through. It's hard to overlook audition just because of the like the third act kind of twist to it is 
so shocking just as like you might be thinking this isn't very extreme at all i am verging on board and then the the yeah. whole thing comes apart and it is at the time certainly one of the most shocking things i'd ever seen yeah itchy is itchy the killer is the other one i'm probably most familiar with i've i remember again it being shocking but i think that was one i felt that on first watch maybe i didn't take it all in i only watched on the it first fairly recently and i'm not entirely sure what happened at the yeah. end and did you watch the little sort of anime prequel as well to Itchy the killer i don't think so no yeah it's it's a lot about a man let's there's no there's no way to there's no way to beat around the bush about this it's a lot about a man absolutely coming his pants while killing people. Um, not, not sometimes not in his pants, sometimes just on the floor. Um, it's, yeah. it's a hard watch. It's not one necessarily that you'd, you know, got your, got a mixed group of friends about, not all necessarily horror fans, and you sit down to watch that for an evening, but some interesting stuff in there. How about you, Luke? I know you had a season of it. What's your favourite? I think, well, every time I watch Audition, the more the more it becomes that maybe one of my favorite horror movies, maybe one of my favorite mm. movies. I just think there's, there's something kind of surreal and grotesque about it. At the same time, it's something very mundane and it's not, um, mm. pretty real about it as well. Like the family drama aspect. Um, and it just, that marriage of those two tones is, 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 you know, when he first call that time when he calls her and the bag moves, yeah. The guy eating the sick out of the bowl. There's the, that, yeah, there's the sick man that's eating it out of a dog bowl. He's like a tongueless arm. Tongue, there's a, just a tongue flapping about like a dead fi a fish on the floor. I just feel like visually it's like really, really uh, amazing. And yeah, in the ending, the last the last act is... Uh, it's a kind of grim that I really enjoy. The kind of grim mm. that makes me feel like I'm a worse person <laughs> than I was before I yeah. watched it. Yeah, definitely. Does she... Um... You know, does does she kill the little dog as well, the little beagle? Uh, she at least think, she she yeah, at least so knocks she him out. She its head the way around or something, right? Yeah. yeah, glad she gets kicked down the stairs. Then take that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a. Um, you're right. You come away from that film feeling like something's happened to you for sure. Yeah, not to take anything away from the other films. Like I said, there's there's so many I I've only seen like I don't know eight or something. Um, but it's by far away been the, the, the most solid of the Takashi Miike films that I've seen. Yeah, I'd probably want to watch a few more, but it feels like something that, again, if you look at the films of his that I do know, it's kind of one you have to prepare yourself for. It's not a, I'll stick this on in the background. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of like Agent Extreme, did you see the trailer for Prisoners of the Ghostland? It's... Is that the Nick Cage one? Yeah, so Sion Sono, who's meant to be the sort of modern Takashi Miike guy, who's an insane filmmaker. Uh, him and uh, Nicolas Cage, I have no idea what it's about. I, it just looks kind of cool. Cool poster I saw. It's on um, at Fright Fest, right? Is that yeah, this yeah. week, next week, last week, some point in time for when you're listening, from when everyone's listening to this? Interesting. Yeah. yeah it, it was a film, it is or was or will be a film at Fright Fest this year. <laughs> Um, yeah. along with um, there's another kind of extreme Asian horror, it's Sadness hmm, I think that I might be know. close that might be closing, it's like a um, all feels very real, it's like there is a pandemic which for a while means everyone has to stay in um, you know, oh, yeah. they're more, they're more well, inconvenienced than anything else yeah. but then, after that, they all come out and everyone starts getting, I imagine the sadness and it makes them kind of a bit zombie -y, but but they are alive and they're mostly doing they're like it makes them really like sadistic murderers basically everyone turns into a right wrong and oh, okay that sounds interesting yeah there's some really good films that look like they're on fright fest this year hmm. and we didn't even get an invite no we didn't even get an invite for. yeah sad eyes next year <laughs> we'll maybe next year like when travel is a little bit more certain and people feel a little bit more certain about going to places we'll yeah. Try and go along. Maybe do some special apps if people are interested. Live yeah. from the show floor. <laughs> that sounds good. Um, any other news that we saw? Oh, the, the Spider-Man. Um, oh, yeah. 
No Way Home trailer teaser teaser trailer block dropped. Yeah, teaser kind of our. Out. I know we always like. I know we're on the surface a horror podcast, but I think we always have to mention. I think it's fairly obvious we all enjoy the the superhero movies. So yeah, yeah, it was exciting to watch that trailer. All of the new phase stuff, to be honest, and I am a little behind in the fact that I've not seen Black Widow yet. Kind of dropped when I was getting ready to move. So yeah, I was Same. busy. I want to I catch know, up on Black but... Widow before I go and see Shang-Chi, which also looks good. Have you seen Suicide Squad yet? No, still not. Okay. I'm still actually going not. again tomorrow because my uh, Skip, our friend Skip, uh, is going... He wants to go see it, so I'm going to go with him tomorrow. Oh, I might go to the cinema tomorrow. Depends what time Karen gets home for work, but it's either that or Free Guy, which I'm also hearing good things about. So. We went to watch that last last week we're doing a we're doing a weekly movie thing now that's what we're nice doing. yeah oh yeah we need to i need to get caught up with a couple of those but yeah spider-man in particular looks to be a lot of fun i always like when spider-man and dr strange get to japes i always like like i always think of madam web or the spider-man animated oh. um show bit with i think i talked to my friend about this today in the um animated show they had the multiverse thing happening and they yeah. had Ben Riley the Scarlet Spider as like a little cameo. And I was like blown away. Oh my God, they've got Ben Riley the Scarlet Spider. In this day and age, I want, I think we should get a Ben Riley Scarlet Spider movie and or TV show. Yeah. And I'm not taking no Marvel. <laughs> we've got to get we've got to get one. Every, we've got Moon Knight TV shows. We've got um WandaVision. Why can't we get a Scarlet Spider Ben Riley TV yeah. show? Ben Riley would be good. Ben Riley would be good. Get Toby. Get you know who played Ben Riley good, Andrew Garfield, because he's been scorned by the Spider-Man franchise a little bit, so he could probably be a little bit, you know, a little bit scarred. Yeah, is is that animated series of Spider-Man? Is that your entry point into the character as well? Because I know certainly it was what I always thought of as Spider-Man for a long time. Well, 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 well. yeah, yeah, that and Ultimate Spider-Man a little bit later, I think. But. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, I was I was huge into that series and that I guess that um, Secret Wars thing that they used to finish the series off with yeah. all the different Spider Men and before that, I think maybe it was one of the first times I realized that oh, these individual things I've seen cross over. So there's Iron Man with with uh, Spider Man and there's the Fantastic Four in the same place and yeah, it was great. It was great, great series, and I'm looking forward to. I'm looking forward to seeing it pan out, what they're going to do with it. Like, Well, if it, it's a, it sounds like the Multiverse of Madness, the Sam Raimi film, is probably going to be quite linked to this one in, in other yeah. ways, which is quite exciting. Yeah, they're all building up to a lot of things. And I imagine that teaser trailer is any person who does a trailer breakdown with, you know, red arrows and like yellow circles that you draw around <laughs> things. It's probably their dream because there's so many. Is this that I've seen that I woke up this morning 128 like, things you might have missed from the 10 second teaser trailer yeah it's, yeah it's all the things you might have missed and then loads of wild speculation of well, that's daredevil's arm that's matt, <laughs> Mur- that, that's matt that's, murdoch's arm that's the the hulk smell there. that's the you hulk just, smell yeah. you see this little blob in the background here that's a venom <laughs> but yeah, yeah i'm 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 looking forward to it it feels like with the load of trailers they've dropped recently the one thing that seems to have washed over a lot of people or people don't know what to make of is the Eternals, right? I don't even know what they are, to be honest. I've I've read very little Eternals. It is, it feels like a, an impenetrable thing. I mean, Jack Kirby's behind a lot of it. So it's, you know, a legendary creator, but it's, it's huge, huge stuff. Um, and yeah. I know so little about it. Is but, it is it the Marvel uh, New Gods essentially? Yeah, is it? effectively, okay. it is yeah. Marvel. It is Marvel New Gods, and they're tied into a lot of other things in various ways. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know what? I know there are some people that are like, "Oh, maybe this one isn't going to be for for me or what have you." But I remember many years ago when uh, they pitched the Guardians of the Galaxy film, and I was like, "Oh, I'm less familiar with these guys." I'm not sure. I'm not True. sure if I'm as excited about it. Probably one of my favourite movies they've done. Yeah, yeah. You should really watch the Suicide Squad. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no spoilers. But are you? Um, were you especially satisfied having read the um, 
you know, the Grant Morrison Justice League run with Starro and that as well. Yeah. Oh, I was, I was, man. I mean, I, I actually think some of the elements have probably been, because I had no idea really what they were doing with Starro in, in, in it, but now I've seen some of the promotional material. Um, I think you, there were some things that might have been a bit spoiled, maybe not so much, but I just didn't know they were going to go all out Starro <laughs> quite like they do. It's, yeah, it's 100% Starro. Oh, man. I have to really hurry up and see this. I'm away again this weekend, not at the cinema. Well, <laughs> when I get back, then yeah. now's the time. Uh, well, speaking of stuff you might see this coming week, have you seen anything this week that has just been has just been done happen? Um, very little, if I'm honest. We ran straight from the last episode. I watched Creep Show early, and then we've been. Uh, busy in writing and editing because Halloween is creeping up on us, as you know, Luke. So yeah. a, lot of, a lot of writing, a lot less watching this week, but obviously always time to watch the film of the week. So the one it's like doing this podcast is the best reason because then like, even if you feel like you're not getting much time to watch any movies. Yeah, yeah. There's, um, you know, there's, there's something that you say, oh, well, I've got to sit down and watch this, got a podcast to record. It's a good excuse. How about you? Well, so I watched Free Guy at the cinema, which is not a horror in any sense of the word. What I will say is, so it's basically Ryan Reynolds, he's a computer game character. He's like a sim. No, no. It's like a Grand Theft Auto game and mm-hmm. one of the one of the uh, NPC characters becomes sort of self-aware and it's that kind of thing. Um, what I will say about it is that it's a lot of fun and it's like a really high concept, high budget entertainment film that you just don't see anymore. Like you get all the superhero stuff, sure. But this this reminds me of the Truman Show, or you know the old Jim, uh, Bruce Almighty, or I yeah. don't know Ace Ventura, yeah. <laughs> maybe some non Jim Carrey films. I don't know if any existed, <laughs> but um, you know it's that kind of it's a high concept fun film, um, and it's surprisingly decent. Uh, what a, but it does really try to tap into every single kind of trending thing happening right now. There's nineties nostalgia music. There's Ryan Reynolds. There's streamers, so many streamers. The that streamers. Just like, well, Jack, just get Jack Sepsky in it for, he doesn't have to come to the studio. He just record from home. And they've just got so much of that, like the streamer just recording from home. And it just, it makes it feel a lot less cinematic when you're like, I've seen this exact shot on YouTube for hours. Like, I don't, I don't know. It, it takes me out of it a bit, especially when it feels like it, it's not adding to anything. It's just there to, um, it's there to the kids. Yeah, the same as a, you know, someone does a Fortnite dance and the. There's that in there. There's, um, I mean, it's a video game thing, so it it kind of does make sense to have it. Uh, But there's like the Star Wars stuff, Marvel stuff. They're just they're just trying to hit every single thing that they can, and maybe that's because they don't make movies like this anymore. So they just need to make sure. Does it? Do you feel like this is going to be because if you're talking about other things that are taking IPs and referencing them, I know the new Space Jam is a lot like that, right? Do you feel like yeah. this is going to be the thing that there was a huge build up to new Space Jam, and then that feels like it's been so far from the reception, the commentary I've seen, people are finding that a bit on the nose and a bit. This doesn't. Know, feel, this doesn't. Doesn't feel like doesn't that. like doesn't like satisfy people's palate but it feels like this has been really well received so yeah um i think the thing is the actual story is quite nice and quite engrossing and and quite entertaining i don't know space jam i haven't seen it um the space jam is that what they call it they're doing the suicide squad thing yeah um but um i i i don't know i would say i just enjoyed watching it and then it was just those like 20 minutes worth of streamer stuff going on that kind of took me out of it a bit just kind Um, of like oh it's not for you and i heard some commentary on another podcast that you know references back to 90s stuff it's one about um what's the sonic comic podcast really really live in the 90s um vibe there and the guys pointed out on that it's one of those things that takes you out of it at a certain age i think one of the hosts was saying that that bit in how is it infinity war or end game end game where they visit Thor and he's depressed and he's playing Fortnite and he's like, oh, I didn't know he was playing Fortnite, but there was a kid in front of him that was losing his mind. And he was like, yeah, if it had been something that was, yeah. if I had been a kid and it was a game I was currently playing, uh, yeah. I'd have gone mad. That like, oh, this... That's true. Yeah. And there was, there's someone in the cinema who was with his mum, like a, he was like 12 or something. 
and he was like every time one of those kind of youtubers came on the t- or twitch streamers came on the tv he was like oh man that's that's, uh, that's the guy from that program <laughs> or like that's blitz face or whatever they call these people ninja man i don't yeah. know what they're called I mean, uh, it's the same for us, right? If if we were watching something as a kid and Dominic Diamond came on or Patrick Mr. Moore, yeah, Mr. Motivator, we'd be like, oh, <laughs> mom, it's in I'd be even, TV. Imagine if Mr. Motivator turned up the free guy. I would have lost my mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man, what a time. But yeah. Jeremy <laughs> Beadle. <laughs> that's, see, that's the nostalgia film I want to see. One that brings back like Mr. Blobby. Yeah, Mr. Bl- I was gonna go to I was gonna go to Mr. <laughs> Blobby as the one as well. The cultural icon of childhood. Oh wolf. Yeah. All of them. Oh, Jet. Like that that'd be it. Like he sort of goes, oh, I choose your champions, free guy. And he goes, I choose Wolf and Jet from Gladiators, and they're coming <laughs> to help him. Wow. I'll choose a referee. Phew. Oh, John oh, Anderson. <laughs> yeah. I want to see that oh. nostalgia uh trip. That'd be amazing. Yeah. That'd be great. And I think that's the thing as well. I haven't seen the movie of Ready Player One. Oh, um, but yeah, I know that I know that is a huge thing that on paper should be exactly my thing. But I started I started on the book and for all my best efforts, I really bounced off it. Like I was like, oh, I've, heard um, a lot, I've heard this as a lot of people felt similarly. It felt like um, at some points I, I, I got where the story was going, but and you know, not a criticism of a much more successful writer than me, but it is a criticism. I bounced off it because it read a lot like lists. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it's like, oh, you know, a plain defender on my 1982, you know, my 1982 Atari and things like that. And I was like, well, you're reading it like you're showing that you know all these things. If the references for people who know it, you can just say you're a plain defender yeah. and leave it at that. But it feels like it's a very extensive it almost feels gatekeepery in some bits and things like that and you know yeah. it's it's incredibly popular and i know there's a huge amount of excitement for ready player two and i have a feeling of guilt that this is designed for people like me and i just couldn't get on with it and i feel like i might have yeah. to read it again but like it came to a point i was a few chapters in it felt like homework so i was like no no more yeah yeah um yeah i, I mean i would i'd say it it's a fun watch. It's not going to blow you, blow your bollocks off, <laughs> but uh, it will entertain you. Uh, <laughs> I also watched Blood Red Sky on Netflix, which is the, the vampires, the stakes on a plane, as people were yeah. saying in the chat. Um, That's I a much better it, title. Should have called it that. <laughs> I thought it was. Um, oh well, I I called it Vlad the Inplaner. <laughs> which maybe also isn't quite as catchy. Why aren't uh, they employing you guys for like taglines <laughs> for movie? Like stakes on a plane could have been a great tagline. Yeah, that is pretty great. Um uh it's okay. It's about um a woman who is taking her son across on a plane to it. I think she's going from um I don't know, from Germany to um Transylvania uh, to Transylvania. <laughs> From, I think from Germany to Scotland, I think I can't remember. Um, anyway, she gets on the plane, and it's a it's a um, Con Air kind of no, it's not a Con Air, Air Force One. One of them, anyway. The the there's terrorists on the plane, and they they no. take over it, and they're doing some evil scheme, um, and then they don't realize. But this one woman who she's like freaking out for some reason, who's our main character, um, they like take her out. What are you doing? What are you freaking out for? And they um they they dispose of her. They don't realize that by disposing of her, they've unlocked the vampire within. Vampire um, and powers. it's basically vampire versus uh con air on a plane. Okay. But it does go it does go pretty crazy at the end, uh, which is fun. But it's just it's quite slow. I feel like it's that kind of film should be really zippy and pacey. Uh, but yeah. it's quite how, slow. how long is it? It feels like that is a good. 80 minute like just a splash fest but... like a zinger of a film yeah. it should be a zinger but it's not a zinger it's a it's a longer it's a longer film than oh, you'd expect no. it to be yeah. what what is it does it run out of momentum do they have trouble sticking to a landing or an ending or <laughs> well the funny enough the plane does land oh. uh but uh the film not so good. <laughs> i actually think like the last half an hour is fantastic i just think it takes a while it takes too long getting there yeah because to be fair 
that film on its own, that concept in the amount of time you took to explain it is enough. Yeah. Like I don't I don't need that much more backstory or explanation. There's a lot of flashbacks, a lot of lost style. Oh no. All the island. Don't care about flashbacks. What you'll want is the te- unless we have one flashback of the terrorists going the terrorists going, okay, we plan for every possible eventuality that could happen that will stop us doing this hijacking. And then one of them's like, Oh, um, what about vampires? They go, Shut up, Jerry. No one's interested in a stupid <laughs> vampire contingency. <laughs> yeah. And then when he when the vampire does come out, Jerry's like, hmm. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but people uh, still don't want to hear his plan. Yeah. That's bit that's about it. Other than uh, creep show. I've been reading a lot, but um too much too much gone about. Uh, and there's a lot of creep show to talk about. There's like there is much creep show. There's five creep show. Five creep show. <laughs> Yeah. A whole bad plus, creep show. Plus a wraparound story. So yeah, creep show. Creep show came out in 1982. It's an anthology film which tells five terrifying tales inspired by the EC horror comic books of 19 of the 1950s. I haven't got it written down, but um, it's directed by George Romero, and it's it is. is it all written by Stephen King. I think screenplay is written by Stephen King. Yeah, I think it's the cool. whole thing. Uh, I mean, that makes sense. Um, his fingerprints are all over some like, and he's he's you know hamming up one particular story. Um, in terms of ratings, it's got a six point nine out of ten on IMDb. Rotten Tomatoes says it's seventy four percent critic, 68 percent audience. Letterboxd is at three point six. Um, some truth reviews here. There's a lot of love for this one, I will say. Mm. So Lucy T A said, "All things considered, Leslie Nielsen is pretty fuckable in this." Five stars. Uh, that's from Lucy T.A. And um, Firemaster put complete pile of dog crap, half a star. And Jerry put, I love this movie. It doesn't scare me like it once did when I was a kid, but I still enjoy it after all these years. Half a star. I have a feeling he might have accidentally <laughs> clicked the wrong. He might have clicked, <laughs> yeah. Classic Jerry. <laughs> um, um, yeah. But uh, I said too bad at well, I said a good one and a bad one, a kind of confusing one, but the majority of them were really positive. I will say, people love this film. It's the film yeah. we grew up with. I feel like this is one of these films as well, and we'll go to the individual stories. But I feel coming away from this, certainly me, I haven't watched it for a number of years, but I was a fan of it many years ago when I first saw it. I feel because of the anthology nature of it, the thing that sticks in your head are the stories that you like the most and then the ones that don't work so well for you kind of just forget they happened yeah it's the same with any anthology they're all going to have ups and downs depending on your preference um i was yeah so i said about the stephen king fingerprints he if you read any of his short story collections he really enjoys a short story where someone's got like a plan or something and it takes them (laughs) ages to get to it i'm thinking of like the the crate episode or uh, Leslie Nielsen, the tide on. He loves people who've got an evil plan and they're going to take ages to get really execute on that yeah, plan. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, even his, own, even his own story has got, has got, the guy has a plan. You see him planning it, but um, yeah. It's quite... <laughs> I quite like that. In this film, there's a lot of like um, imaginary flashbacks and imaginary flash forwards where they're thinking <laughs> yeah. like that well, specific episode with Jerry. Is it Jerry? Stephen King, where his name is. Oh, isn't it Geordie, maybe? Uh, who is it? Uh, Geordie, he- Geordie Verrill, yeah. Geordie Verrill, that's the fella. Like, imagining... That feels quite literary, or feels like what yeah. Stephen King... In a Stephen King book, he would write out someone imagining the horror. Two, $200, not a penny less. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you, you, you watched this earlier early on? Um, yeah um it's been a long time i feel like there's i have some memories of seeing at least parts of this growing up particularly remember the image of the ape and then i watched it again maybe as a you know teenager early 20s had seen it again you know with a retro feel to it by um... does this hit your nostalgia hit your nostalgia button organ parts of it do but 
it might be a mix on this one because I don't remember I saw this film enough as a little kid for it to really be my main memory of seeing this is as already an adult and it was already a piece of like retro horror content that I really remember seeing it I think the nostalgia bit I get from this and the hit of it is the some very familiar faces in the ways that you know the heights of their fame perhaps and I see them you know case in point Ted Danson and Leslie Nielsen are in the same story and yeah. Ted Danson is of an age that I remember growing up and seeing him when he was, you know, incredibly popular in Cheers, which we used to have on at my parents' house as a kid. And they used to laugh when the laugh track came on, even though I didn't get it. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, you can watch it now. It's on Channel 4 of the mornings and you think, oh, actually, this was funny. I can see why it was popular. But Leslie Nielsen was a big nostalgia hit for me because he is the naked gun guy when I was growing up. And I used to watch those films yeah. to death. I used to watch them constantly and of course tell. yeah it's horror classic <laughs> yeah horror classic dracula dead and loving it as well what a, what a time yeah. <laughs> how about you what's your sort of i only watched history? it for the first time like a couple of years ago i think um i do not have any nostalgia for this film at all which i don't think puts it in good stead because uh, it seems from all the comments i'm reading on letterbox it seems to be the kind of film that people would just put on when they were doing other stuff, like a Saturday morning, just shove creep show on and just, I don't know, play with your Lego at the same time. Yeah. I think maybe if for some people, this is how I feel about like, are you afraid of the dark or something like that? Where I just, yeah. just watch them over and over and they're probably and it's pretty crap that, now, but it's got that kind of feel to it as well. Right. It hasn't got anything that apart from a few minor points, there's nothing that's too explicit in here. Yeah. I feel like, especially if you had a kid that was into horror comics, I guess like the comics themselves are intended for in the 50s, right? It's a, it's very overtly, this is horror stuff. This is a spooky guy and is a monster. Yeah. And it's, it's not anything, there's no subtlety behind some of those horrors, but it does feel like this could be... Um, reflecting back to your conversation with Alice and so on hmm. for the right kid you have a morbid little kid like I was or whatever you could sit and down in front of this and this could be a yeah. entry into horror without too much of your effing and jeffing and your you know your other stuff that goes on there that really makes it unsuitable for a kid feel that this is something you could give some kids as their entry into it yeah yeah exactly um so i mean the cast list is huge uh, we've got Stephen King's son, Joe King. He's credited here, but he is the author, Joe Hill. Uh, and a, a really great author as well. Have you read any of um, his Lock and Key comics? I've read um, the first couple of volumes of Lock and Key I've done. I've got the rest. I you know, got it on a digital sale later and filled out the rest of the collection, but I need to get around to reading them. It's great. Brilliant. Really, really good, yeah. Um, so Joe King's in it. We've got... Um, oh, um Tom Atkins plays Joe King's dad. Yeah, um, he's uh, from a film a couple of weeks ago, right? He's the detective from Maniac Cop. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Adrian Barbeau, I saw, as a really annoying wife in one of them. Um, oh, yeah, for a second when she was on, I was like, is that the, is that the receptionist from Jack Frost? But it isn't. <laughs> just got, she just got a similar haircut in that era. Ed Harris. It was just like doing this really stupid dance. Yeah. Ed Harris is an interesting looking guy. Ed Harris right. is dancing at first glance. So it's that Robocop, but it isn't. It's Ed Harris. <laughs> if, yeah, I don't even mean it. He's got like a similar sort of shape to him. Um, who else? Is it? Um, Stephen King, obviously. Stephen King, who is like, we mentioned this in the chat earlier, hamming it up so much. He's having the time of his life. Yeah. I do bet he could have been like an actor or something if that if or a performer of some kind he's very comfortable and confident being kind of big and goofy yeah he had a he had a great time and i think as you said while we were chatting as well as much as he is hamming it up leslie nielsen is playing the straightest role i've ever seen him in hamming it down but yeah. even though leslie nielsen is is speaking quite straight it sounds like he's delivering because he, when he's delivering lines and they could get he delivers them so like uh, deadpan yeah he's a, he, he almost, comes across very seriously in this it sounds like he could be you might you maybe just don't get the joke 
Like he's saying something funny. I'm just not sure what it is. <laughs> I read a little bit of trivia on Leslie Nielsen as well, that even though he played it very straight in this role, he did bring, like, because obviously he's on the surface a very famous comedy actor, um, he brought, like, a fart machine in his pocket. So then when <laughs> he was doing very serious takes, he would set it off just to, like, make everyone else laugh and put them off. So in many ways, poor, poor George Romero probably had a nightmare, like, getting loads of, like, laugh takes out of everybody. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I think he's one of the best things in this. I think so, too, yeah. Um, Ted Danson, we mentioned... Richard Gere, uncredited as Man on TV. Who was Man on TV? So it, at one point, is the TV the on and just I think Richard Gere is on? Yeah, I think so. It's, it's uh, I think it's Man on, in the Leslie Nielsen. There's some, a guy on the news or something talking at some point. Oh, wow. And I always thought, in fact, when I was watching it, I was like, "That's so a Richard random Gere? thing to <laughs> let in the film. Like it doesn't it doesn't add anything to the film." Um, who else we got? Adrian Barbeau. Um, Hmm, don't recognize many they're all the ones that i recognize to be honest either way an absolutely huge cast and and also a skeleton like the crypt keeper's brother yeah the creep the creep keeper i (laughs) if if you what by the way did you watch um the tv show no, I, 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 the t- when it first came out, I don't, didn't have Shudder. I do now. It's on my list to catch up on if I ever have some of the legendary free time that the people speak of. Yeah, it's um, they seem to try to make the creep more of a character. I mean, I don't think he speaks, so it just does that, just as like a big laugh. But they seem to try to make little, more of a. Does a little wave to Joe King when he's at the window when he's a puppet for that time. He's like. Yeah, do you think he should have talked? Or do you think they would have been like, it's too Crypt Keeper? No, it's too Crypt Keeper if he talks, because what voice would, like, <laughs> yeah, look like at it... the, look at that, look at that face and try and imagine anything but the, the Crypt Keeper's voice coming out of it. It'd be a high pitched laugh and like a voice. It's not going to be all right. <laughs> yeah. And it, I mean, you'd just be expecting a pun, some sort yeah. of pun to come out. Yeah. Oh, you know what you could do? Leslie Nielsen's voice for the Crypt. <laughs> yeah. I like it. I like it. Do that. Um, so, the wraparound story is about a young boy named Billy Hopkins, who's played by Joe King. Uh, he's reading his comic book, but his dad, Tom Atkins, um, he's he's, Tom he's furious, isn't he? Yeah, he's he's a bad dad, Tom Atkins, and he's saying, "Oh, what are you doing? Reading this absolute shit? Um, you can't have him warping the kids." Made a note here that um, poor, poor little Billy being walked by comics is the least of his worries. He's got an abusive eighties dad. Um, <laughs> yeah. What What is the big deal? It's just that he doesn't like comic books. Oh, and then doesn't he like, Joe, doesn't like yeah horror comic books. Thinks they're thinks they're bad business. And Joey even says, "What about your naughty magazines that you keep in in your dresser?" And the dad doesn't even say anything about that. The, the wife because oh, he was, oh, he just says, "Oh, that, and not only are you reading trashy horror comic books, you're also a fucking snitch." <laughs> because this yeah. fucking snitch. He, he does, I think it's like, oh. a, like a uh, uh, like a snoop or something. So like you've that. been you've been snooping. You think you're a snitch? <laughs> yeah. Snitching uh, me. Does, yeah, he said, "Oh, like." Cheers, mate. Oh, so we're both we're both going down now. <laughs> um, but yeah, his dad deflects from that quickly, so he's not in trouble with the wife. He just like goes, "Oh, spending your money on this rubbish, I'm going to waste your money by throwing it in the bin." I remember when I first got some pocket money, about fifteen pounds. I went into the comic book shop and I bought. I think it was was the Ultimate Spider Man Volume One Collected Edition. And my mum was like livid that I'd spent all fifteen pound of my pocket money on a comic book, uh, and I'm I just be like mum, just look at my bookshelves now. You'd be like, <laughs> you'd be so angry with me, but they're kind of an investment um, in a way. I don't think I'll ever sell them. But oh god, like I'm currently kicking myself seeing the boom in like old video game prices. Yeah. Many years ago, now I got rid of all of my kind of older generation stuff because I'd moved away, I'd lived abroad for a while. I came back and my old bedroom at parents' house was like a pharaoh's tomb. 
So it's like, no, I just have to move these things along because I'm not ever going to have a house that I can have room for all this stuff. Yeah. Other people might want to be playing them. And I'm never going to, you know, for the for the storage of them, I may as well just see them go to a new home. So I sold a lot of stuff. Yeah. And a lot of stuff I didn't, some stuff like Nintendo stuff, because that always famously goes up in value. I did sell properly, but a lot of it I did just, um, you know, lots of PS2 and Xbox uh, original stuff. I yeah. did just do bulk and, you know, sell off to a thing. And we got decent money for it. And it was like helpful. Sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, it was. And it was you know, some things came up at more than just a few pence, but mm -hmm. we shipped an awful lot of stuff. And, you know, for where we were in our lives, it was good at the time. It helped us, you know, get money for the first house we were buying and, you know, the work we had to do on that. So it was useful. But especially off the back of lockdown, some of those things, like especially sealed, some of them work. So I used to work at game at the time. So you used to grab stuff on a discount and like just have it on a shelf with no time to play it some stuff still like shrink wrapped and stuff yeah. um and you see some stuff now on on ebay since lockdown and people have got into collecting and stuff it has gone insane ridiculous yeah. ridiculous and i think I could be a millionaire now but i'm not <laughs> oh well but thankfully my dad never threw anything away or got me in trouble um and as your mom got over it she sees you buying a new comic with you i think she now. got over it by the time we got home uh, yeah, she wasn't. She wasn't Tom Atkins mad. Tom Madkins. Uh, so, so Tom Atkins, he throws it in the trash or on the floor outside. I can't remember. Um, and then, luckily, there's a creep in the window. Yeah, the little boy says he's furious, yeah. and in many ways, he's proving his dad right because he's annoyed with his dad, and he goes, you "Burn in hell, mate. You can yeah. you can piss right off to hell, dad." And then while he's thinking about that, the creep comes to the window, gives him a little wave. Turns everything into an animation with yeah. magic. Uh, and then we go into the book, right? Yeah. Into the we first see, story. See the first of our stories, which is Father's Day. Not my favourite of the bunch, I don't think. Uh, it's kind of fine, I would say. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's one of these where... I have a couple of, there's some nice visuals to it, and I like some of the individual bits, but the story itself is what fairly it? nonsensical, right? A lot of the stories are very plain. I mean, very simple plot-wise, right? There's not, like, huge twists and turns. Like, basically, someone gets done in, and then they get they come back to life and get the other person. Or yeah. that seems to be the formula for Creepshow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this one, uh, we've got they're like as a there's a stately home of some kind. There's some kind of birthday party. No, it doesn't sound right. There's it's Father's Day. Yeah, because it's I don't know okay. why they I don't know why the whole family's there sense. on Father's Day. But Ed Harris Without has just married. They've just married. Yeah. Ed Harris has just married into the family. Yeah, dancing Ed Harris, um, and they're talking about oh they're talking about some random auntie. And they're like, oh, that mad auntie who who killed, the, or like that she went out hunting with her. Yeah, like she she or... killed her. Like she comes every year, and she comes every year because she quite obviously everyone knows it's like a family secret that she killed the um, I guess the old patriarch of the family. I guess all of their dad, most of like yeah, yeah he, all like, of the he, dad. He killed all none, of them. None of them the was dad. left alive. Yeah, yeah, they killed 100% of the dad. Yeah. <laughs> and we have some flashbacks to... to he's been, to he's like a right jerk. He just sits in his chair and just shouts, I want my cake. Yeah, banging yeah. his buddy, banging his buddy cane against the sides of the chair. You'd give him a chair without arms, wouldn't you? That'd teach him. <laughs> yeah. Or, or put cushions on him. Um, and he's banging the chair. And it. we have a little flashback to the auntie when she was younger um, and she was kind of the member of the family. We've always got one that, you know, that is the closest, the relatives, all the others have gone off to do their thing. And she was kind of stuck living with him, taking, taking care of him. He was banging his cane on the chest and it's father's day. I want my cake. And then he, the straw that breaks the camel's back because he, she hasn't got him a cake and he absolutely cracks the shit and goes, 
you bitch. Where's my cake? And she goes, right, that is it. Does he hit um, her? I think he hits her, right? Maybe he has a swing at her with the cane. He definitely, definitely has a go at her. While it's over the chops. Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. Oh, yeah, he does. Gives her a slap. Yeah. Um, and she's not having it, so she stoves his head in with a, with a tray. Yeah. Um, and now she comes back every year to have a little hangout at his grave and have a bit have a bit of a drink and she's on the way back this year many years have passed and ed harris is being filled in on this story by the rest of the family before she arrives it's got yeah. a bit of a um ready or not vibe to this this family in this house yeah i know what you mean oh there's um so who we got there's ed harris who's the one marrying his family there's there's like a one of the younger men who's uh, I can't read. It's, it's quite gossipy, I guess, is the word I'm looking for. Yeah, that brother is a gossipy little so and so. Yeah. Um, there. Who else is there? There's obviously Harris's wife. There's like the. There's a woman, isn't there? A woman. Just there's the, a the woman. old, the posh older sister who's posh like older sister. Cruella Deville, just like hanging around there. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, and then the auntie comes as as predicted. She goes to see the grave, like she has done many years in the past, except, yeah. and this is where it falls for me a little bit, like the scare comes, but it's for no reason. So this is a ritual that she's been undertaking every year on Father's Day without fail. But this year, he comes out of the grave and says, it's Father's Day, want me cake? I'm a zombie now, BTW, and <laughs> strangles her to death. Yeah. Um, the, the, uh, the, there's like a vocal effect that they use quite a bit in this film. I don't know what it is, but it's like talking through a comb or something, a bit of paper tied to yeah. the end of it. Uh, like a like a gurgly wursly noise. Yeah. Um, the 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 makeup on the zombie is quite interesting because, like, even though he's rotted away, he's bigger than than he was. Like the, the entire mass of his head. So it's obviously like a mask over a real person's head is uh, quite huge. Maybe yeah. he had massive bones. I don't know. Yeah, um, he's he's a pretty from being quite a tiny old man who was stoved in by his daughter. Yeah, he's massive now as a zombie. It's yeah, a big show. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so so our guys are in the house. It's Ed Harris doing his. I don't know why he dances like that. I mean, that's a that's an interesting choice. They've had a little, they have a little dance, and we we have a for what is an anthology film. We have an extensive dance scene, right? We get a good yeah. thirty seconds of them just boogieing before the sister goes, turn that down. Yeah, I can't remember why Ed Harris goes into the into goes the graveyard. Out, goes out for a smoke because Ed Harris's thing is. His character, his personality is he can do a trick with matches. He can light them, like, just like that. Yeah. And he goes outside for a cigarette. He sees a little glint in the distance and thinks it's the auntie he's been told is going to be over. And he nips out to see her and says, all right, is that you? And he falls into the grave to find the auntie dead and then lies there for about a minute while someone slowly topples a stone well, on him. <laughs> Just get up. Like if if you even like your natural reaction, if you see something move, you go fuck it out, and you try and like you you even if like you, you, a shadow of something moving above your head, like your instant reaction is to kind of roll up and away. But now he kind of just lays down. It must be really comfy or something. And yeah. the, the way the thing's moving, it's like as if someone's pushing it. They, they're intending to. Uh, that, get him. Someone's gonna put. If I don't move in the next couple of minutes, someone is gonna push that on my head. Yeah. You know what's the powers where he's got the steamroller and the guy's like, no. no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> much that. But yeah, unfortunately, Ed Harris isn't able to get out of the way in time and he is crushed like tongs under a hammer. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so also the zombie dad didn't push the thing. I think he was using like mind powers. Or something. Oh yeah, because <laughs> he was standing behind him. He used yeah. telekinesis and force pulled it onto him. Yeah, yeah. Um, so at this point, the, the dad is kind of on the loose. He, um, I can't remember what he does, just 
rocks up in the house and starts yeah, his, well his, his demand is quite clear he definitely wants cake so now everyone's in there still and then the next person comes along the you know it's quite oh, it's oh, quite oh, frustrating maybe. to ed, ed yeah ed harris's wife is annoyed that they're they they're not back yet you know ed harris must be just chatting to aunt whatever her name is outside i will go and see where they've got to the old like sort of the i guess the leader of the family now she goes off into the kitchen finds the cook dead she sort of falls dramatically against the glass yeah and there's a little musical sting that she's dead and then um he snaps her head he just, just kind of twists, snaps twists her head around. right off yeah twists yeah. it off like a bird um yeah and that, that's it it's like a quick quick snap then the other two they're sort of debating and have a character moment where she wants her brother to go. He doesn't want to go. Then they decide to go together. They walk into a kitchen and he is converted. It's another weird choice narratively. It's the woman whose head he's just snapped off, not the daughter that killed him. Yeah. It's he's just turned yeah, her into I a cake. That. Why well, sure you do it to the daughter? Like you you get your own back, but it's not that kind of show, apparently. Um the and we get the I guess this would be the iconic creep show thing where we get like the it um the big reveals or the big ending shots they're always kind of um they have like the background becomes like yeah. a colored it swirl becomes, it becomes something. painted almost and they convert it into yeah. a painted image like a comic panel yeah. and throughout this period as well like ironically they were making him a father's day cake on the day he was killed um the but we have like loads of scenes that have like overt kind of paneling over the um over the moving image behind it so you get like a framing device of a weird shape that yeah gives it that comic book feel and i don't dislike it it's sometimes a little bit distracting i guess but um it's a visual choice let's call it that like yeah for whatever reason they tried to do something interesting in many ways like the film that would be negatively reviewed, but I don't think as bad as people give it credit for, The Hulk by Ang Lee. They tried to do some actual comic panelling with it, and it's interesting. Yeah, it, it kind of works. I mean, it's definitely lingering in people's minds uh, um, for many, many years afterwards. Uh, and that's the end of Father's Day. We then move on to the next story. Maybe one of my favorite. I mean, it's, it's a bizarre one, really. The Lonesome Death of Geordie Verrill. Uh, and this is based on a, a King short story, Weeds. Um, and Jordy Verrill is played by Stephen King himself. This is like, I would say, the comedy portion of the... Yeah, this the is movie. definitely the funny one, right? This one is overtly funny, almost slapstick in places. Yeah. Uh, Stephen King plays, well, it says here, a dim-witted backwards yokel. Maybe like stereotypical... Um, yeah um, he's just yeah he's you know probably it's a little bit of a problematic um, <laughs> yes, uh, say, portrayal yeah. of a um, <laughs> of a person that lives in like the not the outback but you know what I mean kind of the the middle of nowhere in one of those one of those states of the US where there is like a really sparse population yeah and you know it's mostly like farm folk and uh yeah, he doesn't portray him as the the smartest man in the world, but one day he looks out of his window just as a meteor has come down. And that's kind of the thing, right? Unlike some of the yeah. other stories, unlike the previous one in this thing, actually, where there's so much setup to what's happening, literally it starts in a desert town and a meteor falls from the sky and he's straight out to come and get it. Yeah, yeah. Um... Uh, and he's talking about uh, I think he tries to I think maybe straight away he pictures himself taking it to the to, yeah. the, to the college to the university he has, or something. it's got this image in his mind of what a, what a college a num- is yeah a number of like fantasies about he said oh, I'm going to take this I wonder what the, them guys down at the college will say and he goes <laughs> to like the department of meteors and he's like <laughs> yeah. oh how much do you want for this lovely meteor and it's like oh, i'll take no less than two hundred dollars it's like a massive the guy. box of cash as a, a toolbox <laughs> of cash yeah um it's fun 
It's fun. And the same guy who works at the Department of Meteors is pretty much everyone else who he ma- imagines as we go on. <laughs> Later on, he's the doctor. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's just about him trying to do that. And he begins, he like, burns his fingers on the meteor because it's hot. Yeah. Uh, I think he tries to fit it in his bucket. And I think it snaps in two for some reason, the meteor. Oh, oh that's when he's trying to... Meteor yeah. shit. And he yeah. gets some meteor shit on his, on his hands. Yeah. And that's the green stuff. I think that's where it first starts. Yeah, he breaks it and he has the fantasy about, oh, no, I've broken it now. And he goes back and has another dream about the thing where it's like, oh, he says something to him. I'm not <laughs> going to take, I'm not going to give you like that $200 for your broken ass meteor. <laughs> like, I'm not going to, um, I'm not giving you anything for that. And it's like, wah, wah. And it's like, yeah. oh, Geordie Barrel, you've done it again. You, It's kind of like old Gil from The Simpsons. <laughs> oh, Gil. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Oh, geez. <laughs> Um, so he uh, he takes it inside, um, and then we start to see like a path of green weeds to the house and from the meteor site to the house. Yeah, um, I seem to remember he watches the TV a lot here as well. Yeah, he watches some, he watches some wrestling, he watches some WWF, yeah, um, which. Was the name at the time? I'm not behind the times. I'm being seasonally appropriate. He watches some wrestling, and just, I guess we see a couple of things that are traits from his character. And I guess this is a Stephen King thing that he's built an entire career on. Right? Characters have traits, whether it's a phrase that they have oh, that's going yeah. to be important, or a or the a tick phrase. that they have. So <laughs> yeah. this guy has both. Like he has a tick that he's always like biting at his nails or sucking his fingers or something like that. Yeah. Um, and he also talks about how the old barrel look, it's always in and it's always bad. It's what <laughs> that's what he first says when he breaks the um, you know, when he breaks the uh, meteor in half. Yeah. And then he notices that he's got some like blisters and then some gunge on his hands from when he's touched it. And then he realizes he's getting slightly green fingers. Yeah. And then he notices that he's been like dabbing his tongue with his hand the whole time. <laughs> and having a having a beer and things like that as well while he's been watching TV when the weeds have started to kind of Yeah. Does he take... dream about it at some point? I seems to remember he, he dreams about some maybe thinking a bit of his dad. He has, another day, he has a daydream about having his hands going funny and he has to go to the doctors and the same person who was the scientist is like, gonna oh, cut those, fingers off those fingers are going to have to come off. Sorry, <laughs> this is going to hurt. And he just goes and gets like a big, like... Stephen King's doing a kind of pantomime character as well, even more so in like the flashbacks. Like he's almost looking at the camera. Oh. <laughs> doing that kind of... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's very, you know, and again for trying to capture what it is trying to capture particularly things of that era so you're a 1980 like you're a film from the early 80s capturing a comic book from the 50s and 60s and trying to bring across that that feeling um yeah it it does that incredibly well it's incredibly successful that kind of thing because all of the visuals are over the top and exaggerated. The characters are caricatures of what what is going on, and the the way the exposition and everything works is very comics of that time as well, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so he, I think at this point he he does he goes to have a bath because he's itching. He's turning into the Grinch basically, like he's. Yeah. At this point, I think he's kind of half covered um, in like a green fluff. Um, it's yeah, super it itchy. And then he's going to get in the bath and he sees his dad in the mirror and he just starts talking to him. He kind um, of says, no, don't go in that bath. If you go in that, it's the water that it wants. And if you go in that bath, you're as good as dead. Yeah. Um, and again, like, oh, dad, you've been dead these, you know, near three years. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, he has a big old glass of vodka, but that doesn't make him feel any better. Doesn't um, like the bottle kind of get all green and stuff as well. Yeah, wherever he's touched, and we're seeing like there's been a couple of lapses forward in time, and you're seeing that he is getting more covered in green goo. You see, he goes to the toilet at some point and obviously looks at his crotch and goes, "Not there." Yeah. Um, yeah. So, 
and eventually he does just, does he just decide fuck it and get, jump in the bath or does he fall in in a com- comedy of errors I don't know because he does linger staring at the bath for quite a time I'm not too sure but I, I do know that the next time we see him I think he's completely covered in green fluff yeah he's, he's evolved from he's evolved from the Grinch into Swamp Thing now right yeah and he's going to shoot his head off. <laughs> yeah, he shoots his head off and he, this is kind of, he's, we've got that voice effect that you've already noted. And he kind of, he kind of says, oh, you know, let it not be in this time. I guess he's talking about his luck, that he wants to actually have good luck enough to shoot himself in the head and it work. Um, yeah. And he does, right? He is dead. He's been shot in the head. But... Um, there's like rains or something that are going to spread the... Yeah, so all of where he lives is basically like outside is like jungle now, effectively. You've got these yeah. weeds everywhere and you hear the TV on saying, oh, forecast, there's going to be a lot of rain. Yeah, You're going to be surprised how much plants are going to grow with all this rain we're going to have. So um, I guess the world is fucked. I think so. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. And you said this is one of your favourites, like this one, Jordy Verrill. Uh, I just think it's quite fun. I mean, I mean, it's probably one of my favourites because because of Stephen King, um, and you kind of like you get a big a good sense of his humour in this. I mean, even though it's, it's camp and over the top as he is in this, um, it, you, I don't know. He always comes through in his writing as well. Like he is a quite a funny guy, even though he yeah. writes about such dark stuff. Yeah, he um, always puts a bit of time in for like the humorous asides, and yeah. sometimes, you know, it, it works a different effect. Sometimes when you're reading a book that's already seven hundred pages long, you're like, yeah. "Come on now!" <laughs> but um, yeah, but um, I, I think it's it's a nice touch, and for an anthology piece like this, it's nicer to have this this kind of light-hearted one in there. Um, yeah, has Stephen so. King done much more acting? Is he in any? I know he sometimes cameos in some of his adaptations, right? But what else has he been in? Um, I don't know. Let's have a quick Google. Um, some sort of Night Riders, it says here. Don't know that one. Max Overdrive, but of course, because he uh, directed that creep show too. Uh, Sleepwalkers. Oh, Sleepwalkers is one of the cat, one of the cat people. Yeah. Um, a lot of his own stuff. Yeah, I know he had a thing about appearing as a, you know, having cameos in his own stuff. He's a real M night about that. But um, Sons of Anarchy. Okay. Well, good for him. It's yeah. nice actually. I think as a, you know, someone who is mostly famous as a writer and i bet it was fun as well that his son was going to be in it and you yeah. know it both feels, to do this whole thing things. feels like it's got a huge stephen king handprint all over it. maybe even more than the george romero i don't know like in the in the storytelling and the acting and that kind of camp horror stuff that i know Stephen king like i mean i don't know it feels very stephen king although the zombie stuff is obviously yeah, the next story is the one I feel most of George Romero's hand in. Uh, so the next one is something. Is this something? To t- something yeah, something, something to, to, to tidy, tidy over. over. This story was written specifically for this film, so not based on a short story. This, I don't know. Yeah, this feels. As you say George Romero. I feel like I can imagine reading this as a short story, and um, yeah, like the effects. Sure. The effects feel. George Romero and the cinematography feels him here. Yeah. But the the story is definitely a Stephen King short story. This might be my favorite because of the nostalgia for the actors. I think the performances in it are actually really solid. Um yeah, I like this one. It does sometimes feel a bit like a Columbo episode, I suppose, but um I like Columbo episodes, so there we go. Oh, I th- I think this might be one of my favorites as well, actually. Um I don't know. I think it's maybe like the ludicrousness of the plan. Yeah. Um, I mean, surely if you, I mean, I've been buried 
up to my neck in sand before. I'm pretty sure with a bit of effort, you can just you can, climb out. You can get out. And like you could do things like, you know, move the sand around. You could dig your way out, I think. But on the face of it, it's a fun plot. And yeah, I like the I like the delivery. So we begin with I don't actually know their real names now. I'm just thinking of the the names of the characters, but basically Ted Danson's at his house hanging out. There's a knock at the door and it's Leslie Nielsen. He's like, you come out of there. And like, otherwise something very bad's going to happen to, you know, this, this lady. Yeah. And he answers the door. Leslie Nielsen is there with a gun. No, he doesn't have a gun yet. He's just having a go at him saying, basically, um, I know you've been sleeping with my wife. And um, if you don't come with me, something terrible is going to happen to her. And he's like, oh, I'll call the police. He goes, if I'll, or I'll, what happens if I just beat you up? I don't have to come with you. So, well, if you kill me or you send me away, you'll never find out where she is and it'll be too late yeah. for you, mate. We so learn, he goes with him. We learn a couple of things about Leslie Nielsen's character. He doesn't let anyone take his stuff ever. Like, it's a big rule for him. And also, he loves video systems, VCRs and CCTV systems. So he's he's uh, he's in, like, what did they call it in America? Like, the, uh, the American high schools. The, like the AV club. Uh, he's, he's the president of the AV club. Um, yeah. I never kind of forgot about it because uh, he's talking about oh yeah he's like cleaning up Ted Danson's video and it's, it's like all these cables I'm surprised you haven't noticed the deficiency in the picture because the cables aren't slightly in or there's a bit of dust on there or something yeah and do you reckon that's to imply that's how he's been spying on them maybe he's but maybe he's set a little something up there as well who knows who knows but yeah probably but yeah um, so go on he takes uh, Ted to the beach takes him to the beach and then he basically goes i'll see that bucket over there and he runs over thinking he's done something to her um and he hasn't there's no one under there there's just a spade um leslie nielsen is very clever he doesn't do the mistake that a lot of people do with guns in films by standing really close to someone so then they can just wrestle it from them he's a good few paces back and he's pulled a gun on him and says right dig yourself a hole um and he goes, oh, I'm not going to do that, you lunatic. You just bloody shoot me. He goes, no, no, like, I'm just going to... And he... It's, it's, a, it's a good horror situation because the alternative is that you just get into a fight and you're probably shot and killed by this man. But there's always just that little thing that you just think, oh, maybe, like, I'll, if it's just plausible that I have to go along with this. And it's yeah. like, okay, dig a hole. So right now, get in the hole. And it's like, no, you'll do something terrible says no i'm just going to incapacitate you so you can't get me and then i will tell you yeah. where he is we'll tell you where the where the girl is so ted anson gets in the hole and starts pulling the sand down around himself at first and this is another great line a uh, bit this is before it happens but after he's dug the hole and um, leslie nelson tells him to get in he starts like shouting for help and he goes, oh, I own this whole island. So he joins in with him, like, <laughs> he really, like, he shouts, he shouts for help louder than Ted Danson does. He's really yeah. going for it. And it's like, no one's here. There's there's no way to get anyone. I own this whole place. So just do what I tell you. And I'll always, I keep my promises. I'll let you know where she is. I'll let you yeah. see her. So he does it. And then we kind of transition forward. And it's Leslie Nielsen just like patting the bit of sand down. <laughs> around his head so he's completely buried yeah um and he's like oh you've got a bit of sand on your face there he's like slapping the sand off me smacking him in the (laughs) face to get it off him he's it's any no wonder that actually like is this an actor that was maybe typecast for his comedy stuff because it feels like in a different world leslie nielsen is an incredibly set like successful like just serious actor or do his like almost like villainous roles he, yeah he could yeah. play like a, a batman villain he could have done like um uh i imagine he could have had his you know robin robin williams did that like picture oh one hour photo one hour photo he could have had his one hour photo moment i think he could come across really terrifying in the right yeah in the right performance no, or no um, now you've said it luke in your ideal world, so you're the casting director. Um, yeah. of a Batman what, what what Batman villain is Leslie Nielsen? <laughs> I mean, instantly I'm going to Two Face, but that seems a yeah. little bit too obvious. He could do a good Two Face, though. Yeah, 
he'd, he'd say something face. serious looking that way and he'd turn the other way and he'd, he'd offer the punchline to the joke yeah. of what he just set up. Yeah, to, he'd do a good two-face. I could... You could do a fun Riddler, I guess, as well with uh, Leslie Nielsen. Like one of the fun, like I'm thinking of like a semi-comedic, like a Jim Carrey one, but like play it differently yeah. with him being an older guy. Um, <laughs> or maybe one of the like really outrageous villains that like is just one of the ridiculous ones that like, make him like the Clock King or, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or the guy that does all the egg puns. <laughs> Egghead. King Tut. <laughs> yeah, I think one of the more obscure ones. Um, I'm trying to think who. I don't know. Um, who do you, who do you think he should play Bane? Who do you think uh, if you listen to this? Who do you think Leslie Nielsen should play if he was a a Batman villain? Yeah, tweet in. Tweet um, in yeah. Yeah, he does. He does great. Yeah, back on back onto the plot. So he does that terrifying bit. And it's like, oh, I buried you. But this is when he's getting ready to slap. I could just finish you off, and he like pulls it off his face, and you see the panic yeah. in his in his eyes as he just starts like covering him up. Um, because no, 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 I promised I'd keep my word. So then all of a sudden he goes and gets like a like a big truckload of video equipment out, <laughs> yeah. plugs it in, gets his, his extension cable, and he shows there's a um, the video of the girl who is up the beach in the exact same situation as Ted Danson is. She's buried up to her neck and the waves are starting to splash on her face. And he goes, oh, sorry there, mate, but she lost the coin toss. She's further up the beach. Um, and he yeah. basically comes to his plan saying, you see, you mustn't panic. And again, great sinister deliveries. Like, oh, you mustn't panic, you see, because when a wave is on you, you've got to, you, you're only going to have a few seconds when the wave comes away for you to take a breath before the next one comes. So if you're going to survive this, you're going to have to really take your time and you're going to have to keep your nerve. Uh, now I'm going to leave you here. So I'll leave the TV on for you until it gets shorted out by the waves. Yeah. But um, basically I'm not, technically I'm not killing you. If you're able to hold your breath and you can, and you can, Keep your nerve and uh, not panic. Maybe the tide will let you out, and then I don't care. Like do what you want. But yeah. anyway, bye, and off he goes. And he goes home to his apartment, which is like full of monitors and and video equipment. Um, and he watches. He even like lays back, quite chilled on the sofa, like he's had a long day. Just stuck, stuck some Ricky Lake on the TV or something. Yeah. <laughs> Ricky Lake, um, and he's uh, just watching just the heads of them yeah um i think ted danson does quite well for quite a while but then he starts to say i'm gonna kill you yeah and like he's he has, not taking a breath in that has a look down like the barrel of the camera doesn't he because he's left a camera film so he obviously knows that he's watching him it's like you listen to this dickhead um i am gonna get you if it's the last and then like you know you see him while he's concentrating on shouting and he literally just gets plowed into by a number of waves and then we see a nice underwater shot of him literally like completely submerged in the water yeah. um drowning effectively i know that bit's going to be have been done you know in a tank on a on a stage but do you think they actually did bury them on a beach at some point yeah it would bury them on a beach in terms of the water um that's that seems quite uncomfortable to put an actor through that to have then buried in the beach whilst there was water splashing over him. I mean, maybe they were, could have been like they had like a bucket or some. I don't know. And they were like, "Watch yeah. out, Ted, get ready." And then they. Or I it. guess it could be that basically, if you ever really get, if you ever really did struggle, much like you could just stand up and get out of it, and the take could be over. Yeah, he has long hair as well, doesn't he, Ted? Yeah. Thing is, if you've got long hair, which I used to have, but I do know this, um, when you get it wet, it kind of covers your ears, so you don't get any water in your ears, which I absolutely hate. So that's good protection you can have there. Yeah. So Ted would have been fine. Yeah. Um, the poor woman though that plays like you know on the TV monitor, she, she gets dies absolutely off. smashed with those waves. Yeah. She kind of dies off screen, but on screen in a weird way. We only really see her when she's dead, like actually yeah. moving around. Um, how does it? So they they drown. They drown. Thingy goes back the next morning. Goes back. Yeah, and they're gone. So the tides taking them away. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, taken yeah, away. Anyway, 
Yeah, they're definitely gone. <laughs> back to back to home then. And he takes he goes to collect his TV equipment. So there's no evidence of that, I guess. Um, and he goes home for a lovely shower. Um, and yeah. gets on with his evening, sees Richard Gere on the telly, I guess. Maybe this is where he was. Um yeah. and then he's just has a shower and is getting ready for bed, and we see like the mists creeping up to his house, and this is where we get our George A. Romero bit. Yeah, so uh, what happens if we get them just walking up the stairs or along the stair hallway? Yeah, there's that nice little bit where he first thinks someone is there and you see the silhouette of someone outside the window. He doesn't see him, but we do. And he steps away and it dwells on it for a moment longer where there's just the figure of someone standing at the glass. Yeah. Um, and then they move along before he looks back. But it's slowly but surely getting closer and he's getting start, starting to get nervous and he starts shouting like, you get out of here, I have the gun, you understand, my boy. He's got some great, like, <laughs> very nice era language. Or it's like, oh, listen, I have the, yeah. the gun, you understand, I'll see for you, Jimmy. And he, um, I liked this bit, that there wasn't a, uh, there wasn't like a, you know, he creeps out and they jump out and then literally, they come piling through the door when he opens it. Yeah. They open, he opens the door and they are there and they're all they're kind of like, Sea monster, yeah. um, sea monster zombies now covered in seaweed and bit waterlogged. He gets a shot in of the head, and like it's the explode of gun. I think he thinks they're just people in costume or something at first because he doesn't seem that bad. And he shoots them in the head, and then he starts to laugh. And then they're like, We're gonna take you. And they, 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 I feel like they're talking to him for ages. Yeah, and eventually do, he just like loses his mind. Kind of, it kind of agrees. Yeah, he locks himself in the bathroom, but then they can teleport like Droopy Dog, and they're behind him when he turns back around. Yeah, um, in the bathroom with him, and then for those on the video, we get this picture that's my background here, yeah. with him just absolutely loses it, and he's laughing. And their plan, you saying Luke about Stephen King liking a plan? Now the zombies have a plan. They're like. They're very fair zombies. They want him to do the exact thing that they did. Say, right, you've got to come to the beach with us and you'll be fine if you can hold your breath. I don't think we've seen it, do we? just see footsteps leading into the sea. Oh, we just just see... um, I think we might have seen the footprints coming away from the sea earlier on to indicate they've come away. Right, yeah. Um, But then they basically explain, said, oh, like, the big thing they keep repeating is if you can hold your breath. And then we have our final shot of this one where it's now Leslie Nielsen buried up to his neck on the beach. Yeah. And um, he seems quite confident, Luke. I think he's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, does it, how, does it, um, <clears throat> how does it end? You just, um... he's, just, he's just laughing and said, oh, I can hold my breath. I can hold <laughs> my breath for a long time. <laughs> and then just, just, the waves, just the waves are coming at him. So who yeah. knows what happens to him? Maybe he survived. Yeah, I really like this one. Yeah. Um, me too. Yeah. Um, so what, there's the crate and the uh, the bug. Yeah, one. we've got we've got the crate and the bugs to go. By the way, every time I both times I've watched this, I've always been surprised by how much film was left. We got to the end yeah. of this one. I was like, I think this is like near the end of the film, but it's like a bit uh, more called the crate. Yeah, I think there's three, yeah. But and there's then like there's an hour left. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um and I think a lot of that hour is spent on the crate, the setup of the crate. I actually really like the crate um, episode, uh, but I do feel like it, the setup takes a long time. Yeah, uh, the setup on this one is a big one. This is your Stephen King plan. This is another Stephen King plan. So this one, uh, it says here, uh, I lost it. I think it was uh, based on a short story of the same name. Um, I wonder what collection it's from. Um, Is it literally just the Creep Show comics? I've managed to seek out a couple, but they don't, they're not too readily available, I don't think. I think it's there's a, a Stephen King short story. Oh, is it? So it's one of his stories, not a comic one. Yeah, I'm not too sure if it's in a collection. I feel like it should be. Oh, I'd like un- to read that. Collected, it says, which is interesting. Um, yeah, I could imagine reading this as a, as a Stephen King short story. Yeah, so 
the basic gist is um, there's a, a university or, or something that has like a big historical history department, archaeological yeah. department or something. Um, the janitor finds a big old crate in this like locked off section under the stairs in, the, in this basement. Um, and he sees it um, and he pulls it out. Oh, no, he doesn't pull it out, but like he's looking at it. It says like 1842 or something on the side of yeah. it. Um, and he it's... calls the head of the department who's at a barbecue at the time. Yeah, and he's like it's some old boys' magazines or something. Yeah, it's some old National Geographic or whatever. But he go, he calls this guy to see him and he comes away from guess is important to the plan that's going to come apart. They're at a barbecue with the rest of the faculty and his best friend, his best professor mate is also there with his wife, Wilhelmina. Everyone calls her Billy though. Yeah. Play, this is Adrian Barbo and she's putting on like, a, she's like the Janet, Janet, Janice of the, um, of the episode. Really whiny voice, constantly talking loud, constantly introducing herself to everyone all the time, seemingly. And also um, constantly belittling her husband. Yeah, basically saying like, you know, you're not only you, you know, this big university professor and everything like that, but you're actually useless without me to deal with everything for you. Um, yeah, yeah, and she, yeah, you're right. She really like berates him and puts him down, and is like gossiping with all the others. Just a terrible party guest. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't remember how it gets it. at some point the university professor goes to check on the basement stuff yeah so the the head of the department gets a call from the janitor to come and check this box out and he goes all right i'll come he goes and this is where we get the his friend's first like fantasy of killing his wife he goes oh hey and turns around and shoots her in the head um yeah for that turn. and then everyone else yeah. applauds um <laughs> Yeah. Again, it's a nice little nod to some of the things that is going through his head. It's a nice visual way to put it, I guess. Yeah. Um, I liked this scene. Karen was sat in the room with me and she was half watching it at the time. And she looked up like, the fuck? And he just shot his wife. Said, no, just just a dream. Um, yeah, so he obviously is, is sick of his wife. Um, their relationship has gone very yeah. sour from, from what it was in the past, obviously. And he's getting, dreaming of getting rid of her, but how will he ever find a way? Meanwhile, the um, <laughs> his yeah. the the head of the faculty goes, and the janitor is saying, oh, "Let's have a look." So they open the box together. Um, you know, there's some back and forth and some discussions about the history while they open the locks and and get in there. Um, short version though is open it up, horrid ape in there eats the janitor right up. <laughs> Yeah, and it's like, um, it looks a bit like, is it Alf? Not yeah. Alf. Is that like a, a bit big, like a Bigfoot? A bit like, he's a bit like an Alf, a little bit like evil Harry and the Hendersons. I think it might be Harry and the Hendersons. He's a very big, he's a very big toothsome ape, isn't he? Um, his color, the ape's coloring, um, obviously, this is before the fact, but got a Congo feel about them. In fact, it looks a lot like Harry from Harry and the Hendersons. It's like Harry and the Hendersons times the Congo apes. Yeah, yeah. Big toothy ape. <laughs> um, and also there's this ape, I, I don't know if it really wants to get out of the box, I don't think. Like it does kind of reach out and stuff, but it always seems to go back in most of the yeah. time. So it eats the it eats the janitor, it bites his arm off and the guy can't help him. Yeah. Um, and it's got him and he runs away. He runs up the stairs and bumps into a PhD student and does some really awful explaining. And yeah. the it's quite simple. Like there's a monster in a crate under the stairs it, from 1832. What's not to understand? Even if you don't <laughs> want to explain it that way, if you just said there is a horrid ape down there, phone the police. <laughs> yeah. Um, but he does, he does a he does a terrible job of explaining. He just does some real film explaining where he just repeats oh it's horrible it's horrible a monster monster <laughs> eating him up and the guy's like monsters don't eat people up come on let's go yeah. down and have a look at it together you're just really you're just really stressed they go downstairs um 
that said, to be fair, the PhD student very quickly does believe him when he finds like the big, all the blood and the chewed up shoe and everything like that and says, oh, I want to get that shoe so we can measure the bike mark. Yeah. Um, the ape has gone back under the stairs. It's gone back into his box or something. He's moved the box under there on his own as well, hasn't he? So he's taken the box under the stairs. I yeah. think... I think the guy puts the theory forward like it's felt safe under the stairs for all those years, so it has chosen to go back there and to hide. Um, I mean, it's been there for like a hundred and forty years or something. Just in a box. Just in a box. Um, but it doesn't take too kindly to that boy getting the shoe because it gets him next. Yeah. Uh, I think the boy stands his ground for like a second or something uh, and then the monster gets Gouge, him and gouges his face yeah yeah there's that thing where his um he puts his hand on the boy's face and pushes him against the wall yeah. um and he's obviously got like blood on his fingerprints or something because it leaves like the blood handprint on his yeah on his head and he does a scratch down his face and turns him into a model turns him into a captain scarlet like last like last week yeah. In Life Force, turns into a Captain Scarlet and he's dead and it's got him as well. So then the university professor runs out of the house, he runs out of the university, runs to his friend's house rather than calling at the police station and that. Because I guess over time, the 80s was probably maybe the last decade where you could, if you see something quite scary, just go mad, become insensible for a while. Yeah. Um, it's it's something that humans have evolved to over time, I guess, as we're exposed to more horror media. Back yeah. in the you know the Victorian era, you saw something spooky, you could die from it, like a horse with a stomach ache. You would pass away um, if you if you saw something too spooky. Unless you like live at the seaside for a while to convalesce, you could die of it. You get a brain fever, and that's it for you. By the time yeah. we get to the nineteen eighties, you just go a bit crazy for a while. You need a stiff drink, and you can recover. Nowadays, I feel like you can experience some terrible traumas and probably go to work again the next day, like Sydney from Scream. Um, you know, yeah. she's straight back at school the day after her best mate's killed. Um, but yeah, of this era, you've still got to be careful. You're going to have a few minutes of madness. So he goes to his friend's house. Um, he is due to have a chess date with him anyway. And Billy is out um, at her classes or whatever she does for the evening. Um, and he explains to his friend there's a horrid ape. Um, so he hatches a little plan. He's already dreamed of strangling Billy um, as well as she left. Yeah. So he, he hatches a plan to get a once and for all, a convoluted scheme. Yeah. Um, uh, so he, yeah, so he leaves like a note that he's written for Billy um, and he, he goes to the the uh, school and he starts like mopping up all the blood he's working really hard to clean up all the evidence of, uh, of, of wrongdoing even though no one's done any wrong at this point really just an ape, just I mean, the ape. Yeah. You can't, call in the RSPCA to get that sort of thing. you don't have to get that get that monkey in the ape house at Twycross C yeah. um, so and the letter like basically says oh uh, my friend the, the professor guy he's He's been hitting, he's been hitting on and hitting um, some students, <laughs> some female students. Yeah, he's out on that. And Billy, at this point, she's already kind of noticed him. She's clocked onto him flirting with some young female students at the party. Um, so, and he's like, in the note, he tells Billy, "You're you're such a cool headed." He kind of plays into her. Um, ego basically yeah, her it's character of being like so capable and she's like you're right i am a real cool dude i know how to deal with these things she's got a glass of milk she's eating it up it's glass of milk she pours some like whiskey in or something it's like a, a dot of like uh, scotch and by the way she drives and then she when she arrives <laughs> at school she's got still got the glass of milk <laughs> still got a glass of milk she takes it with her <laughs> she's that right this is going to be a two glass job is it is it, a white, is it a white russian she's kind of me no oh, maybe like she has made herself a white russian who knows either way at very least she's got a big old glass of mostly milk with her yeah um she gets there just as he's finished cleaning up he's literally just done the last little job 
and she arrives at the university. She goes down with a milk still in hand. Uh, just enough time, she's seen the broken glasses from the PhD student. He goes, oh, what's this? He goes, oh, I just, just found these on the floor. Plausible Did explanation. Her? Did he hit her? Like, she's, she's, like, really into it. She's desperate to know what he's... Yeah. She uh, loves the gossip, I think. What he's been up to, yeah. Yeah. Um, and he's he almost loses it. He's, he starts laughing. He says, oh, no, I think you'll find it's really funny. She's um, hiding under the stairs. It's like... It's not the best joke, um, but he like shoves it towards the stairs. Go on, have a look. It's funny. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. And this he loses it completely. He like, yeah. He like basically, he, you know, when you want something to go too soon, like it's like a little kid that will like, you'll tell your mom what you've got her for a birthday, as you've handed it to her in the paper. You're so close. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's slippers, mom. Oh no. He starts. Um shouting for the beast and shaking his wife for a very long time just back and forth back and forth over and over again and adrian uh, billy doesn't seem to really care she's just like she's rattling around in mind <laughs> yeah it's rankling. I, I love it <laughs> she just stops and he goes are you quite finished <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then basically again she has such a low regard and low like there isn't any fear there of this husband character. Yeah. I don't think like even in the face of it where you're calling for it, I guess it's hard to come put into context. You don't know there's an ape. Um, he's really losing his mind and shouting and, and everything like that. And she clearly isn't afraid. She's like, are you quite finished now? You know, if you want to fight, then I am absolutely going to pan you, mate. So unless you want to get, unless you want to get decked, you're going to, piss off out of it um but, but it does but it does come out i can't yeah the, remember the, what ape, the ape then does come and it gets her um and then he padlocks it back in like he yeah it's quite a tense moment he's like sneaking up with a little padlock and he just puts it back in there and it tries to get out but he's but he's caught it and he's done it yeah he's drugged his friend at the house by the way he said oh, have a have a scotch it'll make you feel better full of sleeping medicine um, yeah. So he's passed out at home, and then he goes back to see his mate as he's waking up in the morning. Like the do, 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 music comes on, and it's like, "Well, good morning. Don't worry, I dealt with that." Um, so I went and was the ape in a quarry in a box. So <laughs> that's it all right. It seems so ludicrous to me. Like he, you could a slightly different version in a parallel and a what if version of this story. The college professor found an old gun in the basement and the husband's lured his wife down. He's get he's gave the professor some sleeping pills. He's lured his wife into the basement and shot her and was the was the body off the cliff. Like, why does it have to be a monster in a crate that's made him finally go? I guess that I guess it's a Leslie Nielsen. I did I didn't actually I wasn't actively killing her. Yeah, like something the, else did the killing. The ape. But then again, bearing in mind that the ape did it anyway. Why cover it up at all? Could he have not said, "Yeah, it's oh, been locked in there for a hundred years. Just put it back." Yeah, it's, com it's well, it's completely implausible that there's an ape in the thing. So even if you just say, rather than your wife having just disappeared, could you not just say, "Oh, this big crisis happened. The professor came and he was ranting and raving about an ape, which of course is ridiculous." So I went along with my wife to see if there was an ape. There was an ape, and she was eaten by it please now take this ape away, the authorities. But he doesn't, yeah. he chucks it in a quarry. <laughs> Which also, I think, is about it. That box has is, is stayed steady for... It must be old, rotting wood. I think I don't think uh, introducing water to it is going to be the best idea. And also, it's going to be bouncing across the rocks at the floor. Like the padlock, yeah, I imagine that's not going to go anywhere. But the, the wood around it, I think that might weaken. That's, that's going to perish, yeah. Yeah. Um, but he basically says to his his friend, wakes up in the morning and says, "Oh, what we do now then? Like, how do you know I hadn't phoned the police?" And he's like, "Well, I know you didn't." Um, and then basically, don't worry, me and you, we're going to play chess every week. What a good time we're going to have! <laughs> um, and then he goes, "What if it gets out?" And he's like, "Mate, it is in the quarry, drowned forever," um, because I know that this this one hundred and eighty old year old at least ape 
is not waterproof. Um, yeah. But it isn't. And we have a final shot of the bottom of the sea, the crate breaking open, and we get that comic framed pair of eyes like New Labour um, coming out. Tony Blair in the crate is out. He's free. Yeah. <laughs> Tony Blair. Um, <laughs> And then we're up to the final story, which I think might be the weakest. In terms of gore, it's the best, I think. Yeah. But the weakest story overall, I think. I don't know. It's um, There's not it's a huge quite, amount that goes on in it. It's quite a weak story, and it's a it's about a bad bloke um, who kind of deserves it. Um, but... There are some touches to it, and you're right, the, the, the gore and the effects in this. Is this the one, or maybe we'll come to it at the end, but of all of the creep show stories, which one would you least like to be in? Uh, <clears throat> what, as in a victim in? Yeah, which one would you most, what, which one would you least like to experience? Well, this one's pretty bad. So what we've got, the crate, I think you just get munched, and you'd be dead pretty quick, or they'd be quite harrowing an experience yeah. um, to be dragged into a box. Uh, what is the, the drowning one? Does does not sound fun at all. That sounds like that's a horrible way to die. Yeah. Um, then I mean, you've got fair, this one. We don't really know even what happens. I mean, he gets the bugs get inside more than one quick go, or 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 it happens. Was he always full of bugs? Was he always full of bugs? Is, is it, that where is they it... were coming from? Is it magic? I don't is it know. Me? <laughs> yeah. Um, but, or like yeah. the the first one. Would you like your dad to twist your head off and not making you him a cake? I think maybe the first one because you've got a shot against a zombie. Although he is a telekinetic zombie, that's a whole different beast. Yeah. That's a whole different box than Cabin in the Woods. Yeah, I feel like that's the best one to be in because I like my dad and I would just give him a cake if that was the thing he wanted. You just want a cake? I'll nip to yeah. Tesco. They've got like some pre-mades for yeah. three quid that are excellent. L- Lemon drizzle, I'll tell you what, I'll get you a Swiss roll as well while I'm there. Mixed yeah. media. Do you, want a, do you want a chocolate cake? And he's there um, with his hand, strangle hands ready and goes, yeah, okay. He just puts them down. <laughs> yeah. Puts something on the TV and said, yeah, I'll sit down, put your feet up, dad. Literally, t- yeah, ten, ten minutes. On. Ten Tour minutes. de France is on. You love Tour de France, yeah. Oh, well, it's the it's the Oxford Cambridge boat race this weekend. That'll be a treat. <laughs> Put that on. Which one of these expensive schools will win? Um, There's some butterscotch biscuits as well. Some um, scotch, what they call the little cakey biscuits. My dad loves them. Oh, like little shortbreads. Shortbreads. That's the one. Yeah, yeah. get you some shortbreads. And so I'll tell you what. Tesco, I'm not going to get the big Tesco, I'll get the Tesco Express to get the cake. Won't take the car, I'll walk it, put the kettle on now, tea will just be right for drinking when I'm back. Yeah, so at what point do you kill him? Um, <laughs> I guess you just... When you he just snoozes halfway through Tour de France, he's gotten very relaxed. You just, <laughs> you just push a stone on him, a big yeah. gravestone. <laughs> just, just put it over his chair. Yeah. He sits in the, in the wheelie chair. You just re- wheel him back to his grave. See you next year, Dad. Yeah, that's how you, that's how you get him. Um, I guess the crate... I think if there was just a big crate that said that was locked and didn't open, I think I'd probably just respect that and go, oh, it's probably no. not my job to open that crate. I would, I'll just that, leave that. The curiosity will get you. Because there could be like old, great old magazines in there. Imagine that. <laughs> Uh, it, it is nice to find a treasure. But I think once I'd seen the ape, I'd be like, all right, I'm not going to go in there again. <laughs> Just call the police. Um, yeah, crazy. Anything, anything else? I oh, think the, the Geordie dra- Verrill, the, the moss one. That doesn't sound good. Because it sounds like when you, if you've got some sort of illness, asthma where you can't breathe properly, or some sort of chicken pox where you're really itchy, um, horrendous. Not a fun yeah. experience to have. Could you avoid that situation in the first place? I don't think I would touch a meteor. Yeah, I don't think I'd be sticking my fingers in it and putting it in my mouth and stuff. Yeah, and I wouldn't even poke it with a stick. I've seen the blob. Yeah. Stay well away. Yeah. Yeah. I could survive Geordie Barrel the easiest because I also, I think, if a meteor fell down, probably just sleep through. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm not going to be the neighbour that finds that, that meteor. Someone else is going to beat me to it. I'm not good at seeing stuff. People, I've always been in my life. People have always been, oh, there's a five pound note there on the floor. 
I've never been that person. Oh, four leaf clover, never found one. I just don't, I just don't pick up on stuff on the floor. I tend to look up more than down, I think. We maybe show I would have seen the meteor. You might have seen the meteor then. then. I'd lost it. Where's it gone? Oh, yes, it is on the floor. <laughs> so yeah, um, I think we do all right with that one. But on to this last story. Definitely the drowning one is the worst to be stuck in, yeah, either as the horrible. goody or the baddie. That's well, they both tough. get the same fate, really. Um, yeah. I'd, have, yeah. I'd have probably just been shot by him when I was in, yeah. in the bit because I would have messed that up. Um, <laughs> They're but... creeping up on you. The last story was written specifically for the film. Okay. So this one is about like a Mr. Burns in the episode of The Simpsons where he is afraid of germs. Yeah. And he's like in that hermetically sealed room. Um, yeah. And he's always flushing his masks down the it's very now this story the guy yeah. stays inside he doesn't like going anywhere he's got gloves he's always washing things and he's always flushing things down a vacuum pack and he's a horrid old man yeah um and he um he's a he is like a mr burns so he, he's um he owns some sort of big, big company and it starts with someone in the business that got fired committed suicide and he I takes a, a call from their what from their yeah, wife. Yeah, it's a guy whose company they've just taken over. So he's one of his assistants is on the phone, and his Stephen King repeated phrases. He calls everyone bastards. He's like, yeah. oh, look at them creeping up on me, bastards. And he's always going about bugs and people not working. And the his assistant phones him and he's trying to go through. Oh no, really, really good job today. You've made all that money. And he's like, no, I need to tell you something. He's like, no, it doesn't matter. Think about this. And he goes, yeah. like, this guy has killed himself. And it's a guy whose company he's just taken over, basically. Yeah. Um, but he doesn't care straight away. He's like, oh, he's dead. So Good. Like, uh, means you haven't got to offer him a seat on the board of the company. Like, we're just, like, basically he's, he's sorted now. So we've got rid of him. Um, and you're right. His wife phones him up, right? She isn't happy. Yeah. Um, and he's, he's like... Uh... She's like really livid and sad about the death of her husband, but he doesn't really care. He, he treats it like just a, a call from, I think he's quite nice to her in a weird way. Like he, yeah, He's quite cheerful about it. He's like, well, you know, swings and roundabouts, easy come, yeah. easy go. Um, and then he does get a little bit sharp and says, oh, you know, if he's too weak to deal with it, then good riddance to bad rubbish. Yeah. Um, and he starts to see cockroaches randomly appearing in his. In his we don't really get cockroaches in England. No, you know, I've, I've never had a cockroach. Have you had a cockroach? No, I don't think I've seen. Not in the, not in this country. I've encountered them at a zoo. I've seen them. They have little oh, bug houses. Oh yeah, I've encountered them abroad, like uh, in terms of swarms. Actually, it wasn't cockroach. I I saw some cockroaches when I was in Malaysia. We were staying at a place unexpectedly. Um, basically we were going to this island and the day we were travelling to there we hadn't really got a firm agenda on our plan so we'd like got a lift with someone across the country and we'd stopped in this town where we'd catch this boat to this island we were going to go and visit but it was like a religious festival day on the day we were travelling so we got there and the boats weren't running so we couldn't get there till the next day and also the festival um, fast. It was a one of fasting, so no restaurants were open. Yeah. Um, so we found a place to stay, um, and it was it, it cost nothing, and it was and it was fine. And we'd we'd been out and like scoured the streets until we found like a garage where we could buy some food. Um, so we'd gone back there with our you know with our, with our like boil in the pot noodles and stuff like that to just eat something for this night. And we're just going to bunker down and then go to the island in this morning. And there were two beds in this um, this place. And there was this big cockroach turned up and it was probably around the size of a computer mouse. No. Maybe a little bit, maybe well, a bit thinner, but like in lengthwise, the size of a of a, of a mouse like that it would have been like that in your hand. And yeah. I thought, like, I'm not really one for, like, even like bugs and stuff. I'm not one for killing them normally. Yeah. But this was this was too big. Too and I was far. like, I was like, <laughs> I can't, I can't deal with this one. I can't catch it and let it go you're, somewhere. You're probably still hungry at the same time. Yeah. Tired and, I thought, right, and exhausted. Yeah. And I can't sleep with this in the room. I'm going to have to kill it. Um, yeah. So I was creeping up on it. 
in the, in the throwing room there. I was creeping up on it with a shoe and I was going to smash him. And then just before I did that, Another it's person like with a giant shoe got you instead. No, I mean, that's not like quite. Nolan short film. I think probably <laughs> even even worse for my mental state. The, like as I was poised over him to bash him, oh, like the, yeah. the the wing casings opened, and then like a huge pair of wings came out, and it sounded like a fucking zeppelin. It was a like, and it took off and flew across the room. Um, and I can cockroaches do that? I this one could. It was like a monster. Um, so it. It flew How and it the flew across the Jeepers it, Creepers monster. It was like the Jeepers <laughs> Creepers man. He flew across the room and I swung at him and he fell and he went down the side of the bed. He went down the side of the bed um, into the, in, in, like, you know, into oblivion down the side and it was right against the wall. And I just thought, like, we spoke about it with, with Karen and we're like, well, he's gone down there. Like, for all I know, I could pull this back and there could be a nest of these things under there. So I can't deal with it. So I'm not, I'm like, if he's down there, that's where he is and he's staying. But there was two beds in this room. So what we did was, I thought, I'm not going to pull this back and tempt fate. So we stripped the other bed and we basically used all of the bedding from the other bed to make like a barrier. So to seal off that edge. Yeah. And then we just, we just went to bed and we were lying, and it, like it was a whole night of like if one of us like brushed against, you know, if your feet just yeah, brushed yeah. each other, it's like no, oh, it's him. And, like we um we got we got through that, and then we left. Just turned um, into Leslie Nielsen in that picture, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, laughing and like completely lost their mind. Yeah, I felt like it came close <laughs> to that. It was so terrifying. Um, we have another story about when we were traveling around that has rats, but that's another story for another time. When we have a rat centric film, I'll tell that one. Yeah. But, yeah that was the most hor- horrifying night ever. And that's what that man had. More and more cockroaches <laughs> turn up. But I wasn't like him. I hadn't just caused a man to commit suicide and I hadn't, um, I wasn't trying to flush him away. So maybe in that way, that's why I was spared. But yeah. this guy, his wife, the wife says, oh, I hope you die, mate, you absolute dickhead. Phones have been getting quite malicious. Um, this guy, the exterminator shows up. Is that right? By the way, I can't see anything you were holding there. That was the way you took a drink <laughs> from, drink like, from the, nothing. From mid- <laughs> <laughs> um, he's calling the assistant on the desk. And again, it's showing he's a really unpleasant guy. He's phoning one guy that's on holiday saying, what are you doing? You're meant to be on the front desk. So well, I'm on holiday. I'm at Disney World. It's like, well, unless you want to take your family to Disney World with your unemployment money, um, you'll you'll get the other guy to come there. And the guy comes to the door and he's like a really over the top. He's like Benny from um, Total Recall. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, hey, Mr. Whatever your name he is. He's like Benny from Total Recall. Maybe it's him. He's got a very similar voice. Yeah. Uh, and like his voice, they've added some like radio flanger effects or something to his voice. Yeah, it's constant. Yeah. It's- Sounds super weird at times. Um, so he can't he can't get in. The, the lift is broke or something. Is that? Yeah. So he says he's going to get an exterminator out, but then the power goes off. It all starts falling apart. He's got cockroaches coming up out the sink. He's got cockroaches in the food, and he's losing it. Like there's more and more cockroaches coming around. The guy is stuck in the lift and can't get an exterminator out to him. Yeah. Um, and just more and more cockroaches come. I think it's the most relatable in terms of real life fears, right? Because bugs, loads of bugs being in the place is uh, something you can imagine happening. Everyone's encountered some form of bugs or creepy crawlies. Yeah, and these also, I mean, in this film, they're real bugs as well. Um, They do also earlier, I was going to say, in the Leslie Nielsen one, he kicks a crab. (laughs) The crab that's just like Kicking off at him, it's like, what are you doing? Yeah. Yeah, he does kick it away, doesn't he? So, the, I mean, is this this is this animal cruelty at this point? Because also, the, the cockroaches, they're like, he's like just grabbing them, flicking them, and like shoving them into a he's hole, spraying sm- them with stuff. Yeah, he's smashing them. Yeah, they, are they really spraying those cockroaches? And later on, they, they must be pushing them through a, I don't know how the special effects work, but pushing them up through a hole or something. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm sure even if he's smashing stunt cockroaches, you know, like fake ones, yeah. I, I feel like some cockroaches must have been killed at this point. And, yeah. I mean, who am I to judge the the value of different animals' lives? It doesn't quite feel like on the level of the snake in Friday the 13th, yeah. but it is, it is strange that you just use them as kind of props and stuff, but there are lots of them in this film. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this story, so what happens next? So there they're all coming amount. up, they're there all coming up, amount. yeah, and that's and that's pretty much it. They're all coming up, and eventually, he gets overwhelmed and he can't get them all. He locks himself um, in that little, his like, little, even like double sealed room, it's like, so, the, like he's the got crisper a crisper in a fridge, it's like yeah. an extra bit of storage. Well, he is a bit like we'll hark back to last week. This is like his, um. Like vampire crystal stasis tube, yeah. That, um, that he sleeps inside. Um, but jokes on him because the bed. Then he's then he's full of the bed is bugs, and then he is bugs. It's weird because well, uh, it cuts to like the next morning, and then we just see him lying on the thing. The, the special effects are great, actually. Also, like we just see what looks like his real head, um, and we see like a bulge appear on his on his head and like a blood starts to spurt and then a cockroach erupts out of his head and then I think it cuts to a dummy model and it's got his exposed chest and the cockroach is just erupt out of it they're all before out of we his know mouth it, out of his nose before we know it, it's completely he's just like oh like in a bath of cockroaches um yeah it doesn't but and also the exterminator's like I'm stuck in the lift uh, yeah. oh yeah it's <laughs> the... no, 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 no. It's like... oh yeah he's come back up hasn't he so it's the guy from the concierge desk who come up and said are you in there and he's like copying him saying oh these bastards creeping up on you eh and um yeah obviously he's yeah he'll be mortified when he realizes he's joking to a guy that's actually been got by those cockroaches <laughs> yeah but um yeah they got him it's not that's there's not a huge amount to that story which is fair enough it's basically a guy uh, gets cockroaches. <laughs> yeah. Um, so and then it was we... a curse, but we don't know. Who knows? Uh, so the last bit is the epilogue, which, um, oh yeah, has Tom Savini and some other guy as a garbage man, and they find a comic book on the floor, um, and they, oh, they they're going through it, looking at the ads at the back, and they go, oh look, a voodoo doll ad. And, ah, someone's already applied for that. And it's got like the uh, be the strong man on the beach advertisement thing. Yeah. Protect yourself. Anyway, uh, they go, oh, I like to read comic books. Whatever. And then it cuts to the kid uh, who's still in his bedroom. Dad's at breakfast and his kid's not come downstairs. And he's got like, oh, I've got a pain in my neck. Tom uh, Atkin. Uh, yeah. He's got a creaky, creaky neck, I guess. Um, and then we realized that What's his flavor? Old his Billy got a voodoo doll of his dad, and he's like sticking it with pins and saying, This will teach you to take my comic books. Um, I don't think he and kills him or anything, but no, he just sticks him with pins. I mean, it could be said that when he uh, when he said, um, when he said earlier he wants his dad to like burn in hell and suffer, ironically speaking, like he wasn't joking about that. So, yeah. did the, <laughs> the um, yeah. <laughs> Um, he was he was neither Joe King or Joe Hill about it. He um, he was uh, he was serious. He wanted to punish his dad, and so he has, but in a fun way. He's not going to die. Um, we we guess so. We don't know. I mean, it might escalate from here. Yeah, the, next the creeper time seems dad, to approve, though. The next time the dad says he's grounded. The next time, well, you drink in the air again. The next yeah. time his dad uh, says you've got to turn off your cartoons because the Tour de France is on, as you as you know, all dads <laughs> love. Um, which never happened to me in my life at all. I was trying to watch Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and Dad's like, "No, Tour de France on. That's the TV. Take. We only have one TV in the house. Three days that thing goes on. There's nothing but Tour de France on. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's on pause. Like, there's nothing. Nothing happens on the TV when the Tour de France is on. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> uh, so what was I saying? Um, and then it escalates, and this time he just goes, "Right, Dad, you like the Tour de France, do you? I'm gonna tear you." A new pair of pants or something, and he uh, yeah, twist his legs right off. Twist his legs off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he could. It could do. We don't. We don't know. I wonder. It's been a while since I've seen 
this is definitely one of these I remember the most. I remember there's a good one in the second creep show, but I don't know if joking and Stanley return or whether it's got a different framing device. Is it oh, is it the raft? Yeah, the raft is the best one on the second one. That's the one I know. I've not seen Creep Show 2. Oh, the raft is yeah. a great short from it. We'll talk about it another time. But yeah. um yeah. And that's the end of it. That's the end. The end uh, of the little um little thing. I have some name game for you if you're ready. Oh, I'm ready. Pressure's on without Ben to answer yeah. some of these. Well, this first one is another anthology film. It tells five terrifying tales inspired by college chums Mark and Jeremy's. They share a flat in Croydon. Is it Peep Show? It is Peep Show. Well done. Peep Show, uh, Creep Show. <laughs> this other one was an anthology also an anthology, it tells five terrifying tales inspired by a snow blizzard that came out of bloody nowhere. Um, is it Freak Snow? Freak Snow, well done. <laughs> uh, this next one is an anthology film which tells five terrifying tales inspired by a person who hasn't kept up with his or her credit payments and is being uh, hunted by the repossession people. They're going to kick him out. The Reap possession. <laughs> well, I just call it repo, or repo. As, it, as it's called on Channel Five. Can't pay, we'll take it away. Show. <laughs> Show. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, next one in an anthology film which tells five terrifying tales inspired by a four-wheel car that takes ages to get anywhere. Oh, a four-wheeled car that takes uh, four, ages. Four-wheel drive car. Our Most cars are four wheel. I think that doesn't help you at all. It's <laughs> so a car, but I've only eliminated a, a Robin, Robin Reliant. I've, any other car is still in play. Um, yeah. So it takes ages to get anywhere. Yeah. So four wheel drive. So something slow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jeep slow. Jeep slow. Yes. And this last one. It's an anthology film which tells five terrifying tales inspired by a place. For the storage of large quantities of equipment, food, or goods. So it's like a place where you store a load of stuff. Store, um, like in your house or commercially? <laughs> commercially, probably. To be honest, more. Yeah, a this place, one's... a place for the. St this is quite hard, actually. A place for the storage of large quantities, like a big old place where you store a load of stuff oh, and heading down to the warehouse storage place then into the warehouse storage place now this one's tough people will be screaming at their listening devices i'm sure again fuck's sake andy come on um, um no i'm gonna have to pass what is the so an apology film tells five terrifying tales inspired by a place for the storage of large quantities of equipment food or goods is depot Depot, I would have never got it with been here all night. Yeah, that's um, hard. That's hard. <laughs> oh, very we good. Need, we need to rate the film. This is difficult. This is quite difficult, I must say. Because you're essentially rating five films. Yeah. Tell you what, before we go into the ratings, what do you reckon? We've already talked about like what the, you know, which one you'd least and most like to be in. Um, best and worst of the best of, of the okay. individuals. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll do the best. You do the best. Yeah. Is, yeah. Okay. Well, my favorite. Uh, I'm going to say. Um, the tired one. Something to tide you over. Barely takes first place. Just takes first place. I would say over the crate actually. Although the crate's got such a long setup, that's the problem. Yeah, I think we're 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 in agreement on that one. I think "Tide You Over" is probably my favourite because of those performances. Um, I think the performances carry the setup very well, and then the execution is very good. Um, yeah. And then the crate is a second place for me, just because, like you, Luke, at the zoo, I like an ape. The apes yeah. are good. The apes, a, the apes, really fun, good in it. It's and, an idea for a story of a guy luring an annoying wife to be eaten by an ape in a box it's like a bonkers idea but it's yeah good. yeah just get a divorce it's fine <laughs> rather than kill someone yeah um but yeah 
that that's that one. And then I don't know. It's it's hard to pick between the others. Maybe the maybe the creeping up on you maybe takes third place for me because I like the effects that are behind it, even if the story isn't quite so strong. It's quite short as well. That one, I think. Yeah. So you kind of get get your gore quite quickly. It's quite punchy, and then maybe just to round it off, I think maybe two and then one because. Yeah. Two, two maybe feels a little out of place because it is more overtly a comedy thing, but it's quite charming. Whereas the first one I found confusing. Yeah, the first one's weird because it it doesn't. I don't know. So there isn't really much to it, really. And but the what is what is there doesn't really make that much sense because why would he kill? Why is he telekinetic? <laughs> why is he? Making a birthday cake out of a random character and not the daughter who killed him. I don't know. There's a few things, a few questionable choices. It's not that's not the strongest. Could have just lot. been t- could have just been tightened up. But yeah, that's my order. Are you exactly the same, or would you switch yeah, any? I think so. Yeah. Um, best best score moments are definitely um, the bug one though. It's, it's like genuinely a bit squeamish. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean overall. I mean, I'd be sitting. Uh, I'm gonna say. <laughs> C plus. I'm gonna go with. Right. I feel like we. I feel like we poisoned ourselves with B minuses. But I was gonna go B minus. <laughs> yeah, but I couldn't. I can't go B. It's not. It's not a B. I don't think. I don't think I've burned B minus quite as heavy as, as you, Luke. So um, I've certainly done less episodes. So I've got some in the bank. Yeah. I think I might go. I think I might go B minus for this. I think B minus. Okay. I think the memor like how memorable some of the the real killer scenes in this are. Yeah. Carry you through the things that don't work as well. Um, and I don't think we've ever been shy of rating things based on how they were at the time and their influence versus how they hold up today. I say that having known we've absolutely caned some really old stuff, but um, like, yeah. yeah, this is, there's some fun to be had on this one. And I like it as an introduction to horror for, you know, for maybe some kids. And I like the comic book stuff. I'd love to be able to get my hands on some more of these classic yeah, me too. comics as well. Yeah. Might have to um, comicsology before bed. Go and take the Kindle up, see what's on there. Do we know what's up next? I think this is the last one of this little section. This is the last one that's planned. I think we are due for because the Candyman's out next week. I'm touch and go whether I'll be able to go and see it in time because I'm away for the weekend. If we're all able to see it, is Candyman on the slate? If not, maybe something that we can watch quickly during the day um that's on like video and then we will and then we'll do Candyman a week later but Candyman is definitely up early for next month yeah I'm really looking forward to it yeah super, and then super. anything else that we've got on the on the slate that we want to do quite soon maybe we should open it to a vote uh but um it has to be a quick one I think yeah, finally, I guess if anyone's listening, we will think of a quick vote. Maybe by the time this goes live, just afterwards, we'll put the vote in there. And you can vote for one of the films next next month if you're in the Facebook group. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Cool. All right. Um, thanks for listening. Uh, if you enjoyed the show, you can become a patron over at patreon.com forward slash Hawk and Cleaver. Thanks to Kovac Cowman for our theme music. Thanks to ACAST for hosting the show. Uh, thanks for listening you can go join the facebook group horror hangout board of advisors uh be sure to give us a rating and review in itunes and thanks to my co-host andy for being a right horror dude you can go follow him on twitter at, at andy ct writes you've nailed it luke thank you very much <laughs> and i'm at luke of condor with a k nice one Done yeah it. nice one and we'll see the whole gang Next week, when Ben's back for his holidays, all tan, I imagine. You got that nice. Where's he going again? New paint and zoo. Paint nice, paint and zoo tan. <laughs> all right, talk all right. a bit. Bye. See you next week, guys. Bye.